Hi everyone, my name is Usha Scott and I want to give you a warm welcome to our midweek broadcast today. Thank you for joining us and I hope you guys are well. Before we move on, I'd just like to give you a thought for the day. Um, it's from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. You know, at the moment you only have to look at the news and uh, just read about the news and know what's going on. You just have to go to the supermarket as well. Prices are going sky high. There's so many things uh, happening around in, the, in our world. And uh, you can get easily distracted. You can get anxious, especially in this season with what's happening and the changes in our economy. Uh, we can get worried about it. But uh, when you look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, this is what he says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away, store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? So don't worry about your clothes. See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you this truth, that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. So if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Even the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I just want to focus on the, the, the bit where it says, but, all these things are happening, but Jesus is saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it's so easy to get distracted, distracted in everything that's happening around us because by nature we can get worried, we can get anxious. But he's saying, seek God's kingdom first. What does God's kingdom look like? Even during the tough times, you know, it's putting on the lenses, if you like, of Jesus and seeing with his perspective about life is doing life as Jesus did, walking as Jesus walked. Uh, that's the kingdom of God. It's, his kingdom is different from the worldly kingdom. The way that we live our lives, the way that we engage with people, the way that we serve, the way that we work, the way that we love, the way that we give should be different, should be with this perspective of Jesus and how he um, worked with people, how he um, taught people, how he was loving towards people. He had compassion on people. Uh, and when you look at his life and what he's telling us to how to live our lives, it's so important that we have his lens when we look at our world uh, and instead of worrying, trusting in Jesus and saying, actually, in this instant, how would Jesus react? It's when we naturally want to hold on tight when the economy uh, is tough out there, when everything seems expensive, our natural inclination is hold on to what we've got. But you know, God says, give generously, give generously. Even in those times, look at it from a God perspective. What can I give? Um, this week? How can I help someone out? How can I show kindness? That's about God's kingdom. That's seeking God's kingdom first ahead of ourselves because that's where our natural inkling is to do. Um, so let me pray with you uh, before we move on in the uh, broadcast. 
Father, I just want to pray for every person that's joined this broadcast. Come Holy Spirit, come touch every life. Fill them with your peace and your presence. Take away anxiety, fear. Maybe we're distracted with what's going on in our world, with what's happening right now, with the economy, with everything, Lord. I pray, Father God, for your peace just to descend upon every person. I pray that you'll help us to see things from your perspective, with your eyes, with your heartbeat, with your mind. Help us to engage in our world with your eyes and with your love, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So now we'll be moving on to our notices. Just take a note of what's happening at the Bridge Church during this time. If you're local, then please do join us. Uh, I'll see you shortly. see there's loads going on at the Bridge Church but I'd just like to highlight a few things. On um, Sunday the 30th of September we have a light party at the Bridge Church Latchet Road and great to say that actually we're full so we're really looking forward to this event. I know Dawn has uh, organized so many different things so I know that all those people who will be coming will be truly blessed. If you'd like to come uh, because you've missed out, um, then there will be a reserve list. If you want to come, then please email me office at bridgechurch.org.uk and if there's places that do become available, we will let you know. Uh, also on Sunday the 30th, we have Peter and Irene Butts with us uh, for the whole day. Peter will be coming and ministering the Word of God to us on Sunday morning at Woodford and Sunday afternoon at Harlow and Peter and Irene are great friends of Bridge Church and every time they've come they've, we've been really really blessed. Pete has a real prophetic edge to his ministry and I know that if you come you will be blessed and inspired. Um, so if you're local can I encourage you to come on Sunday 
We meet at Woodbridge High School at 10.30 on the 30th of September. Also, a couple of updates for you. We welcomed a uh, Topway Ipinyomi on Sunday as he joins the Board of Trustees at the Bridge Church Woodford. And we would like to welcome Topway. We know that he's going to be a great addition to the team. Secondly, we've appointed a new person for our part-time youth pastor role. And we want to welcome Alison Lay as she starts with us in November. And we're really looking forward to to being together, working together to see our young people grow in their relationship with God and to see young people coming to know Christ. She's going to be such a great asset to the church so we just want to give her a warm welcome. And on Sunday 6th of November we will be having a special service where we will be inducting Alison uh, and praying over her in her new role as the youth pastor. We will have Hannah Williamson preaching the Word of God. So we just want to give you a warm welcome to come and join us to support Alison as she starts her new role in November. So now we come to our time of uh, giving our tithes and offerings. And if you call the Bridge Church your home, this is your opportunity to give to the house. Um, and I just want to encourage you, just as I um, shared earlier that in this season and in this time it's so easy to withhold what God has given us but God in his kingdom wants us to be generous with everything that he's given us and you know there's a scripture that says he who uh, sows sparingly will reap sparingly who he, he who sows generously will reap generously and I just want to encourage you um, we will have the QR code coming up in a minute this is your opportunity to give. And if you want to give, all you need to do is point your camera at the QR code, which will lead you to our giving page. You can scroll down and give to your, for your tithes and your offerings. And um, just as we do that, I just wanna pray for a blessing over your lives as you give to the work of God today. Father, I just thank you that everything we have comes from you. And Lord God, I just really pray for, as, as your people give, Father God, that you will just give us uh, wisdom and guidance in everything that you've given us, Lord. I pray that we would not give grudgingly or out of pressure, but out of a heart and a devotion for you, Lord. Help us always to be generous, to live generous lives, Lord, with, not just with our money, but with our time and with our lives, Lord God in the way that we share uh, ourselves with others, in the way that we love and in the way that we treat others, Lord. I just ask for a spirit of generosity over our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, now we come to the Word of God. And I have to say, Andy was excellent on Sunday. Uh, as we've been going through our mini-series called Solar Powered, Andy spoke on Solar Gracia by get God's grace alone. And he was excellent. Sadly, the video of the preach is not available, but thankfully the audio is, which is what you want to hear the word of God. Um, so can I encourage you, get your pens and your notepads out to make a note of you know, what he's saying. And I know that you're gonna be blessed. I certainly want to listen to it again myself as well. I know that I was really inspired and encouraged. So why don't you tune in to hear what God has to say through Andy, amen? Um, yeah, brilliant. So uh, like Chris said, I'm gonna be bringing in part four of our um, solar powered series this week and um, today we are looking at uh, solar gratia or gratia I don't, I don't speak latin anyone do latin in school expose yourself now you <laughs> privileged few <laughs> archaic languages <laughs> no i shouldn't i shouldn't judge um there's a few people you can ask afterwards how to pronounce this um anyway so this means, this phrase, this Latin phrase is by grace alone. And um, if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to be kind of digging into a little bit of Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 to 9. 
And this is kind of our key text. We're going to be going all over the Bible, bouncing around a little bit. But if we're going to summarize this whole teaching, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. Uh, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church and he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And um, this is the key thing here. Uh, We are looking at how we have been saved. If you're a Christian here, uh, we believe that we've been saved from sin, from judgment. uh, And not just saved, but saved through grace. And uh, and as Chris was saying before, we've got a a, a kind of a a catchphrase or a catch-all for this series that we want to be drilling into people's minds, which is this. We're seeking clarity about what we believe so that we can foster unity within the church and that that unity can bring blessing. And so, so what I'm really hoping today is that we can have some clarity about what do we believe about God's grace. And when we clarify that and when we crystallize it, we can come together around that truth, worship God in that way and bring unity. And that as a church, we will see the blessing of that unity and the blessing of that clarity as we move forward. So, for grace you have been saved. And so our foundational truth here is that God saves us by grace. And if you can hit that next slide. Um, like we've been saying, the key question of sola gratia, grace alone, is what motivates God to save us? What motivates God to help us, to, to favor us, to do anything in this world? And in the 16th century, which is where so many of these kind of beliefs and ideas come from, so many of these doctrines come out of, uh, there was this huge clash about why does God save anyone? And for the Roman Catholic Church at the time, they were looking at the good works people would do in love. And the sacraments like baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper, communion. And basically there was this maelstrom of beliefs about why is it that God would save anyone? And into that, uh, the, the Protestant reformers of the 16th century said, no, it is God's grace alone, our unearned, unmerited favor from God. And, and I don't want to be teaching grandma to suck eggs. I think if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, this, this is a foundational belief. This is, this is a, a kind of a step one of what it means to be a Christian, that we are saved by grace and not by our works. Uh, but I think it's, it's so important to look into this because it's very, very easy for us to say, oh yeah, of course I'm saved by grace. Of course I'm saved through faith. Of course it's what Jesus did on the cross. But then when we examine our lives, it actually reveals something about what we really believe. Because so often times we know this book, we know it well, we can quote it, but actually in the practices of our lives, on our day-to-day life, we, we expose something and we betray something of what we really believe. And so what I want to do today is look at this foundational truth that God saves us by grace alone. And I want to look at just three sort of uh, consequences of that, three ideas that come out of that, and hopefully look at ourselves and say, how far have I really accepted this? Because what my fear is sometimes for myself and for others is that we have accepted God's grace to a degree but there's so much more blessing beyond if we can accept it to its fullest extent. And the first thing we see here is that for God to be gracious is that it is his self-revelation. Now, I want to take you back to Exodus 34. Um, And in Exodus, Moses is speaking to God, and Moses says to God, God, show me your glory. Show me what you're really about. And I wonder if we said to God now, show me your glory, what would we think God would show us? If we said to God, show me your glory, would he show us like the lightning bolts across the sky? Would he show us like the expanse of the earth from space? Would God, like if you've pictured God's glory, what would it be? And you can do this yourself, not right now because you're listening to me preach, but you could Google God's glory and see what comes up. Oftentimes it's like, you know, just sort of lights from heaven and clouds and stuff. And I think when we imagine what is God's glory, we think, okay, it's these majestic scenes, it's these earthquakes, it's the, the Grand Canyon, or it's, you know, anything. And we think, well, it's God's glory. But Moses says to God, God, show me your glory. And God actually tells him something. He says, I am the Lord, 
merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving to a thousand generations. And this is the grace of God. The grace of God is not a simple characteristic. It's not like saying, oh, Usher is kind and John is tall and Vic is good at football. That would be wrong anyway. Um, it's, not, it's not a characteristic of God. It is the very foundation of his character. And it's the most glorious aspect of his character. Moses said, God, show me your glory. Show me who you are. And he says, I am merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. And that is the glory of God. That is the most glorious aspect of God. And that is the foundation for this belief that God saves us by his grace. It is not simply one facet of his character. It is the very heart of who God is. He is gracious. He is loving. He is kind. And he showers us with unearned favor. And uh, there's, a, there's one of my colleagues at work, uh, she's a Muslim woman, and um, she is quite interesting. She was raised in a very nominally Muslim home, and uh, she's recently, kind of in her 30s, started thinking about how she could become sort of more Islamic and taking it more seriously. And I think it's fascinating the kind of things she's thinking of doing. I had all these discussions with her. She's like, oh yeah, I'm thinking of starting to wear the headscarf maybe. I really want to go on my pilgrimage, but I'm going to do the shorter pilgrimage first and then maybe go for the long one when I feel more ready, when I feel more connected with God. You know, I'm thinking of changing the things I eat. And, and this is kind of like step-by-step -step process of easing in to a religion. And I just think it's such a stark difference to what we have here, which God says, it is all of grace. There is no transaction there's nothing I can do to make myself a bit closer or a bit, you know, tiptoe towards God. God simply comes to earth in the form of Jesus Christ and says, you're in. It's all of grace. It's everything I do. And so I want to look at these three things. Uh, I'm conscious of time. So the three things that I think the fact that God saves us all of grace really reveal about him. And the first thing is that we should have a whole new lens to see the world through. You know, I don't wear glasses because, you know, I'm fit and healthy. But for those of you who do, you know, sorry, it was a bit random, wasn't it? Uh, but when you get a new lens, you know, you see things completely differently. Or when you try on someone else's glasses and suddenly everything is completely different. And, and the belief that God saves by grace, that he loves us out of unearned favor and unearned mercy, is actually a new lens that we should see the entire world through. Uh, firstly, it should completely change the way we view God. You know, because so often we can come to God as if he's like a slot machine. Like, oh, I wonder if God's going to answer my prayer today. I just, oh, I only got two cherries, you know, I'm not going to get that one. And, and we think God's completely random. We think we put prayers or requests into God and it just, we'll see what happens. But no, for God to be full of grace means that he's always attentive. He's always listening. He's never random. And again, sometimes we think that we can approach God as if he's like a normal person. You know, people that we want to get on the right side of, that maybe want to butter up, we want to speak to them at the right time, catch them when they're in a good moment, maybe make sure they're not going to, you know, think differently of us, that there's this kind of changeable nature in people that we're aware of and think, I just want to catch God on a good day. I want to make sure I've done all my good things first before I speak to him. I want to make sure that I'm sort of brushed myself up a bit before I approach him. Or we can treat God like that, or, or we can think of God as like some kind of exacting judge who is like picking out our every floor and saying oh I'd love to answer that prayer I'd love to care for you but you really need to sort that area of your life out and but the the doctrine of solar grace teaches us a new lens of God that we don't need to come to God begging or, or bargaining or, or cringing or hoping that God will listen to us but his very character, he says, I am merciful, gracious. It's who he is. And he is constantly attentive to us, constantly, not just willing, but joyfully listening to us, hearing us, providing for us, with us. And, and so it, the way we come to God needs to completely change. But equally, the teaching of grace alone should completely humble us before God. You know, we don't come begging and cringing and hoping. But equally, if everything I have in life, if everything that's good in me has come from God, I can't come demanding or bartering 
or, or even giving God my own expectations of what he should do because everything in this life is unearned and unmerited. So we think, if I can't come begging, bartering, cringing, demanding, how, how do I come to God? And Jesus tells us, says, when we pray, call him Abba, Father. We come to God like a father. We come to God with the, the knowledge that he loves us, that he cares for us, and that he wants to provide for us. And we come not hoping, cringing, expecting. We come boldly, but we come in humility and say, God, here are my requests. I know that you love me and want to help me. But equally, this teaching of grace, this unearned, unmerited favor, it completely gives a new lens of how we see other people and how we see ourselves. You know, it's very easy for us to, to, to put up pretenses in our relationships and to, to think about what other people think of us. Uh, maybe to look across this church with a feeling of pride and saying, well, at least I'm not like that. At least I don't do those things I used to do that those people still struggle with. You know, like to, to have this kind of sense of morality within ourselves and say, I have a right to come before God because of what I've done, and yet other people don't. But on the other hand, sometimes we can despair and we can think, how can I come before God? I'm nothing like that other person. I'm nothing like the holiness that they have. I'm nothing like the commitment or the knowledge that they have. How can I come before God? And the teaching of grace alone, of Ephesians 2, you've been saved through grace alone, not your own doing. It completely levels the playing field. You know, there's not one of us here with a more direct line to God than the other. You know, Chris has been in ministry as a pastor for, for many, many years, and we can easily look at him and think, oh, I, I need to go to Chris and ask him to pray for me. I tell you now, Chris has no more direct line to God than you have right now. And again, we could think, oh, we could be cringing at the back of church and think, oh, I can barely lift my head today because I know I haven't read my Bible all week, and I know I've been so short with my kids this week, and how can I really cut? And at that moment, when we feel so far, we have as direct a line to God as we will ever have, even in the heavenly places. Because Jesus says there's one mediator. There's one route to God. It's not how I feel or what I do. It's the work of Jesus Christ. And it is all of grace. So as we look across this room now, there is not one person any closer to God than you are if you're in Christ. And there's not one person any further from God than you are if you're in Christ. And I want to quote C.S. Lewis here. Uh, he's a, you should read everything C.S. Lewis wrote. He's brilliant. Um, but he's speaking of being a human being. And he's speaking of receiving the grace of God. And he says, It is enough to lift the head of the poorest beggar. To know that we are one with God because of grace. And it's enough to bow the head of the greatest emperor to humble us. And this teaching that God has loved us and, and lavished his blessings on us through totally his own decision, totally his grace, nothing to do with us, it, it dignifies us. We, you are an object of love this morning, not from a human being, but from the creator of the universe. It dignifies you to the extent that no matter what you've done or, or how you feel about yourself or your spirit or your body, God says, I love you. And you cannot make me love you any more or less. And yet it humbles us. Because God says, there is nothing you have done which could make me love you. There is nothing you could do that could earn anything of my love. And yet I've chosen to love you. And we as Christians should be the people walking this earth with the most humility. Taking the lowest place and saying, I don't deserve anything in this life. And yet with the most dignity with our back straight saying, I am loved by someone of an everlasting love. I am loved by someone who has seen the greatest, most amazing things in people. And yet he says, of me, I love you. And the teaching of grace, it dignifies us, and yet it humbles us. And, and we need to have no pretense here in church. You know, if you are struggling with something that you're ashamed of, something that i oh, sure I should have kicked that habit so long ago. Or I'm this old now, how can that still be an issue? The teaching of grace says, in humility, take that to your brothers and sisters. Tell someone. Don't be ashamed of it. 
say, oh, I need, I need your prayer today. Why would I be ashamed of needing help when the foundation of my belief is that I have nothing to offer <laughs> except in Christ? But why would I walk around proud thinking, oh, will I bestow my blessings on this person today? Will I, will I deign to speak to this person at the back of church today? Why would I walk around like that if the core foundation of my belief is that I have nothing to offer except in Jesus Christ? And like I said, we need to be walking not just room, but our, our, our family life and our workplaces with the deepest sense of humility, willing to help and to serve anyone and yet the deepest sense of dignity. Your, your words and your insults, they, they bounce off me because I'm loved by an everlasting love. And, and so this teaching should completely shape and reshape and give a new lens to the way we see other people in this world and the way we see ourselves. The second thing that the teaching of Ephesians 2 uh, brings to us is that we never graduate from grace. Can we hit the next one, Kenny? We never graduate from grace. You know, and this is, this is an insipid, creeping kind of thought that I think gets to all of us sometimes. This idea that, you know, I was saved by grace. That's all over the Bible. I know that one. That's, you know, Christianity 101. That tick that box. But then what happens to us is when we've been a Christian one year, five years, ten years, it's so easy to somehow fall back to saying, I know I was saved by grace, but that was ten years ago. Surely now I kind of should have pulled myself up by my bootstraps a little bit. You know, I know I'm saved by grace, but that was 30 years ago, and I've been a pastor for this long, and surely now God expects something more of me. But the teaching of this is that grace, the grace to save us, is not a one-time event. It is the core character of God, and it is the very foundation of his covenant with us. And I want to say that again, I'm going to go into it, that, that the grace to save us, that unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor and love from God is not an event. It didn't happen once. It is at the very core of God's character and it, and it is flowing through every part of his relation with us. It is his covenant, his promise to us is one of grace. And the moment you die and you, and you see Christ and you're in heaven with him in the heavenly places, you are just as held by God's grace as you were the moment you were saved. You know, the moment I was saved, the moment I finally cried to God and said, I need you to save me, and he, and he put his Holy Spirit in me, at that point, I was saved wholly of grace. And in eternity to come, when I'm with him, completely changed, I will be held there by grace by the love and the unmerited favor of God. And no matter how long you live this life and do this walk and, and, and you're a Christian, you will never, ever come close to God except by grace, except by His favor, His kindness, His decision. And so many of us, it's like, you know, it's like when you learn to ride a bike. I don't know if you guys remember learning to ride a bike, but you're, you're riding along and maybe your mum and your dad are pushing you a bit and you're wobbling a little bit and then you get the hang of it and you're going really fast and then 10 years later you're riding your bike and so many of us as Christians we think, I better take my wheels off now because I've, I've graduated from that and we think, oh, I'm riding along and why am I not moving anymore? Because you've taken your wheels off your bike. We never graduate from the wheels of cycling this faith. I don't know where this metaphor is going, but... We don't graduate from grace. We don't move on from grace. We, we don't start here and move on. And, and Paul speaks of this in Galatians. In Galatians 3, he's speaking to the church and he says, Who has put a spell on you? Who's bewitched you? He said, You started by the Spirit and you're trying to be perfected in the flesh by works. You started in the Holy Spirit by grace, by faith, by just saying to God, I need you, and yet now you're trying to build your own life up outside of that. And like I said, no matter how long you have been a Christian, we need to know it is all by grace. Every moment it is grace. Every second it is grace. There is nothing we can add or take away from that. And so the question I want to ask you, because I want us to look at our own hearts and, and, and really interrogate our motives here, is this. What is it that gives us confidence that God loves us? 
What is it that gives you confidence and assurance that God loves you? And on the flip side, what is it that makes me doubt God's love and his favor? Think in your life, when are the times that you feel most confident of God's love and God's provision? And when are the times that you feel most doubting of those things? And so often, our beliefs about that in our heart are wrapped up in these things. Maybe our own religious performance. You know, for me, it's very easy to fit, to be so confident of God's love and God's favor when I come down off a sermon and someone says, oh, that really touched me, Andy. Oh, that's so good, brother. You're the best preacher I've ever had in my life. No one's ever said that. <laughs> but at that point, when my religious performance is at its peak, it's so easy to say, yeah, God loves me. God's blessing me. And sometimes I'm preaching and, I, and, it just, and only Chris is going, yeah, amen. I'm like, that's his job. <laughs> he gets paid to do that. And I think, and at that point, you think, did I, did, was God not in that? Was I not for that? And it's so easy for us to, to look at our religious performance and say, okay, well, does God love me? No, because I didn't read my Bible and I didn't pray. And Oh, is God for me? Yeah, because I, I, I quoted that Bible scripture and it made someone cry and they must have moved them. And now God loves me. And, and the teaching of Ephesians 2, it's not by grace you've been saved. It doesn't say if you minister and help people enough, if you pray enough, if you read it. No, by grace you've been saved, not by works. What gives me the right to stand before God and to speak to him as a friend and a father? I think this does. It means it's only grace. It's only Jesus Christ. And again, sometimes it's our circumstances. Sometimes if we are living comfortably and confidently, we think, God has blessed me. I've got enough money in the bank. I've got, you know, my kids are finally acting the way they're supposed to be. And, you know, my job's going well. And great, I, can, I love to pray now. And then suddenly when the rubber hits the road, you think, whoa, where's God gone? But it was nothing. God, you know, Paul says in um, Philippians 3, I, I found the secret to living life with much and living life with nothing. I can do all things through Christ not through performance, not through circumstances. And again, your knowledge, and this for someone who loves to know things, I'm a teacher, I love to read, love to know things. This is a big thing for me, and it might be for some of you. You know, I would sometimes look back on what I used to think about God and the things I used to say and the things I used to believe and think, whoa, that was crazy. How could God love me when I barely knew him? And God has to stop me short and say, you think your knowledge of this book earns some kind of love? You think your appreciation of the finer things of doctrine and theology somehow makes you more worthy? No. If you, with the moment you are saved, the thief on the cross who just said to Jesus, save me. Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise. He's as much loved and as much favored in his dying moments in agony as you are on your best day. Because it is all of grace. And again, sometimes we, we, we look to our emotions and our feelings. Maybe we come to church and we feel a bit just put off by something or, or something's wrong in our waters, you know, I don't know, we're in our humors. And, you know, or maybe someone said something to us and we think, oh, well, I can't, can't come to God now. No. Your emotions, they change like the wind. I don't mind, do. And yet God says it's all of grace. And so we have to ask ourselves, we would all probably in, assent to this. If I said, who believes God saves us by grace? Yeah, tick the box. I'm sure most of us are. But we need to think, where do our feelings and where do our activities betray us? Where, where do we feel I can't approach God today because I haven't fill in the gap? Where do I feel I struggle to meet with God? I struggle to think about God because of this happening. Well, that was never part of the equation. The covenant of God is one of grace. He says, I love you because I love you. It's not to do with your works. It's not to do with your performance, your emotions, your feelings. God says, I love you because I love you. It is not an event. It is the core character and covenant of God. And uh, the, the last thing I want to speak about, if we go on here, is that the, um, the grace of God, the grace of God gives us certainty in an uncertain world. You know, we've spoken about our feelings and our circumstances and our performance. But sola gratia, this teaching in Ephesians that by grace you've been saved by faith and it's not your own doing, it's a gift of God. This is not just about 
uh, the moment of our conversion. It's not just about how we became to know Jesus and be a Christian. This is about the whole of our life and eternity. You know, God's covenant with us, that, that Christianese word, God's promise to us, God's, uh, the, the grounds of God's relationship with us is grace. And that is for the whole of our life and for eternity. And we could ask ourselves, you know, what is it in this kind of uncertain world? What is it that, that decides the future? Uh, is it karma? Is it if I do enough good things, good things will happen to me? And you know, again, probably many of us who've been Christians for more than five minutes would laugh that off and say, no, of course not. And yet we live that way. God, I, I went to church. I even joined Activate Team. I prayed, I did this, and then suddenly I've got a redundancy in my job. What's going on, God? And we come to God with those demands and those, uh, you know, questions. Or, or the other way around, sometimes it's fate. Sometimes we look at the circumstances of our life, for, be- for good or for ill, and we say, well, I don't know, it just happened, didn't it? Well, no, because the teaching of the Bible, of, of solar grace, is that the one who runs this universe, his character is holy, gracious, and kind, and merciful. And so this gives a whole new lens to how I view the future. For some of us, we feel, again, it's our personal performance. Some of us, we, and I include myself in this, we're so wrapped up in how we are doing by our own measures, whether that's how we're doing at work, how we're doing in our family as parents or children or friends, how we're doing in our religious performance, and that is the barometer by which we measure everything that should happen to us in our life. And yet God says no. It's his grace. It's his covenant. And I want to speak a little bit about covenant here. Um, again, like I said, it's one of those Christianese words. But the covenant is God's promise to us. And the covenant, the covenant sorry, it's, a, it's the grounds by which God has chosen to deal with us. So he makes loads of covenants in the Bible, basically promises to people. Covenant to Noah, I'm not going to flood the earth again. Covenant to Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars. Covenant to so many. And we speak sometimes of the new covenant. And there's that image of Jesus at the Last Supper raising up the bread and the wine. He says, this is the cup of my blood. This is the bread of my body. The cup of the new covenant. And I want to speak a little bit. I'm going to get a tiny bit technical, but it'll be good. uh, About the new covenant. Uh, And I want to take us to Jeremiah 31. And Jeremiah... He is, um, he's in a bad way. He's, uh, he's basically, his whole country has been destroyed by war. Uh, they're, they're, the, the enemy are camped out outside Jerusalem. There's famine in the city. It's all just going really bad. And Jeremiah's kind of thinking, God, I thought you made a covenant with us to do good to us. And he's kind of having these doubts. And, and God uh, speaks to him in, by way of a prophecy about a new covenant, about a different way of dealing with people that God is going to offer. Uh, because in the Old Testament, uh, the covenant was one of, well, there's a million things about it, but essentially there were laws and rules, and God says, if you can keep these rules and these laws, then I'll promise to, to bless you and to keep you. And if you're unfaithful to them, then I'll have to kind of turn away from you. And, and Jeremiah says, I know we've been unfaithful, but can you help us? And God says, I'm going to send a new covenant. And uh, I want to read Jeremiah 31. Uh, verses 35, is it? 35 and 36. I'm not quite yet, sorry. Verse 31, sorry. So Jeremiah 31, 31. And God says to him, Behold, the days are coming, we're in those days now, when I will make a new covenant, not like the covenant I made with their fathers, not like the old one, when I took them out of the hand to bring them out of Egypt, because they broke that covenant. But this covenant I'll make is a different one. I'll put the law within them and I'll write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I'll forgive their iniquity and I'll remember their sin no more. So notice, what did God say was the problem with the old covenant? It wasn't on God's side. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant because they broke it. The problem was with the people. The problem was if I've made this promise, we've made this covenant, if you do this, I'll do this. And the people of Israel never did their bargain, never did their side. And God said, I've got a good idea. I'll make a new covenant because they broke that one. The new one will be, I'm just going to forgive you and be merciful to you. <laughs> and, and you. And notice, they don't have a side of the covenant. This is a one-sided deal. 
This is God saying, I've got this new covenant where I'm going to forgive you, I'm going to forget your sins, and from the least to the greatest, everyone's going to know me, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people. And you can imagine Jeremiah saying, okay, that sounds brilliant, what do we have to do? (laughs) And then it just ends. (laughs) This is a one-sided deal. The new covenant, the promise that Jesus Christ embodied and made and lived out, is what we are living under now, and that covenant is this. They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. I'll forgive their sins and remember them no more. If you are a Christian today, you are living under that covenant. It is a one-sided covenant. Yeah? If you are worried about the future, if you're worried about yourself, if you worry about any aspect of your life, look to the grounds of your relationship with God. It is not what is going to happen It is not what you do. It is not how you feel or what you think. The grounding of your relationship with God is this covenant. And he says to us, from the least to the greatest, they will know me. I will be their God. I will love them. I will forgive them. That is our relationship with God. It is nothing to do with us. It is nothing to do with our merit or our earning. It is wholly of God. And I want to take us now to... Jeremiah 31, verse 35 and 36. And God is ratifying the covenant. God is um, he's kind of showing them how faithful he's going to be to it. And he says, Thus says God, who gives the light for day and the moon and the stars for night, who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, then... I will give up this covenant. If the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of earth below explored, then I will cast off this covenant. And I I, I want to say to you, you know, I spoke about this a few weeks ago about looking to nature, that, that God's covenant is more faithful than the sun and the moon and the stars. And I want to end us with this, that if you are, if there's anything in you that doubts God's love for you, look up right now and say, the sun is still shining. And God has said, I will give up the sun before I give up this covenant. You know, last night I was driving home and I saw the moon. And I don't always think like this. I'm not like, you know, some like holy superhero. But because I was preparing this sermon, I saw the moon and it brought me back to that scripture where he says, if the moon departs from the sky, then I can give up this covenant. You know, we see, you go down to the beach and there's wave after wave after wave. And, you know, and, and if you watch the nature shows, those waves have been crashing for millennia. And God says, if the waves stop, if that order departs, then I'll give up that covenant. And we need to to take God at his word. We've sang that this morning. He's a man of his word. And his word to us today is, you are forgiven. It is all of grace and nothing of our works that none of us may boast. And like I said, that should completely alter, completely turn around the way we see ourselves. You are loved and yet you are humbled. It should completely change the way we see our relationship to God. He is no longer a slot machine or 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 an exacting judge or or a terrifying person. God is a father who loves us. And his love is wholly a decision of himself. And it should change how we see every day of our life. You know, the psalmist says, your mercies are new every morning. And that is true. You have not been given grace at the day you were saved and hope it lasts to the end. Every day he sees us through that lens of Jesus Christ. He loves us. He keeps us. He wants us. And finally, when we look to the future, with all the uncertainty around family and money and jobs, I don't know what's going to happen in your job, in your family, in your bank account. But I do know that God's grace will be there for you because he's promised. He's not promised that our life will be easy He's not promised that people won't turn on us. He's not promised that we won't you know, have, have sickness or ailments or difficulties. He's not promised that we won't be struck by the difficulties of his life. But his promise is as the sun rises, as we see the stars in the sky, as the waves crash, it is grace. He loves us, he keeps us, and he will never turn from us. And I just want us to finish there. I want us to finish. I know, you know, we, we, sometimes we sing, sometimes we pray. I, I just want us to, to think now. I want us to, you know, they call it meditation in the Bible. <laughs> I just want us to think 
I want us to think on that for a second. I want us to think about the sun and the moon and the stars. And I want you to know, just for 30 seconds, that, that that's the extent of God's love for you. That as they rise every day, so his grace towards you rises every day. If you went to bed worrying yesterday about the future, if you woke up this morning and got a bit annoyed at your kids or your spouse or the person you live with, if you're worried about your work situation, God says there is grace for that. There is grace. You are loved, you are favored, you are provided for. And so I'm going to pray and uh, just going to invite Risha back up to close for us. Father, thank you that your, the core of your character is kindness, grace, and mercy. Father, thank you that when we think of everything you've done, everything you've created, everything that you are, that the very core of your glory and your character is that you are a merciful God, that you're kind to us and that you love us. And Father, I thank you that you've promised to love us forever. God, you've promised that your love and your provision and your kindness and your joy will never waver and never falter. God, that they're all around us, they're ahead of us, they're in everything we do. And God, my prayer is that as we go out this week to work, to school, to our family situations, to all the difficulties of life, God, that we would walk out knowing the certainty of your grace. God, that we wouldn't rely on ourselves, we wouldn't rely on our knowledge, our efforts, our abilities, God, we would be wholly reliant on your grace, unmerited, unearned, but real. Amen. Once again, we apologize uh, that you weren't able to see the video, but how amazing that you can still listen to it. And it was an excellent message. And I know for me, one thing that I took away from it was you know, God's grace is not a one-off event. God's grace is eternal, for eternity. We experience God's grace every day. And that really spoke to me on Sunday. I pray that you've been blessed and inspired by hearing the Word of God uh, today. And I just pray and uh, that you will just uh, listen to it and allow God to speak to you. Well, we're finished, but before I go, I just wanted to remind you of a few things. We have our midweek life links every Wednesdays uh, that our life links meet. If you're not part of a life link and would like to get connected, why don't you email me at office at the Life links are our midweek community groups where people come together and learn about the Word of God. Uh, they are encouraging each other, praying for each other, and doing life together. And I know that those that are joined and connected to the Life Links have really found it a blessing to be part of it. So let me encourage you to do that. Also, we have our social media platforms on Facebook, Instagram, and the YouTube channel for you to stay connected with us. You can also look at our website, it's www.thebridgechurch.org.uk to find out what's happening and to stay in touch and stay connected with us. I pray that you have an awesome week and we'll see you again next week. God bless you.